are a lot of people are turning to the book of Revelation right now because of what's going on in the world. And they're wanting to understand what the book of Revelation is all about. And they think it's about monsters and about all these different crazy things. And we need to understand it so that we can give an answer to those who are seeking that will be satisfactory by the Holy Spirit. So Revelation 1.3, let's read it together. Blessed is he. Come on, together. Blessed is Of this what? Of this prophecy and All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Let's begin in verse 7. Let's look at some of these verses. So it begins with this being a prophecy. Let's read together. Revelation 22, verse 7. Randolph. <laughs> Behold. The prophecy of this book. Look at verse, I believe it's 10. Go ahead, let's read 10 together. Someone read verse 18. All everybody together. Ready? Go. Verse 19. Go ahead. All right, so Revelation 1 3, Revelation 22 7, Revelation 22 10. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, five times the book of Revelation is called a prophecy. Now, what is a prophecy? A foretelling of the future. Has this prophecy been fulfilled already? Let me just ask you the question first. Has this prophecy been fulfilled? No. You know that by knowing what it says. You can only make that decision, you can only say no, if you know what the prophecy says. Agree? Amen. How many of you believe that the prophecy began when Jesus gave it to John, to the early church, and has kind of been kind of going through history for 2,000 years? Okay, that's known as a historical view. A hyper-preterist view is something that is said that in 70 A.D., the whole of prophecy has been fulfilled. Hyperpreterism says that we are now in the millennium since 70 A.D., which is impossible. But we say it's impossible because we believe that the letter was written around 96 A.D. However, the hyperpreterists will say it was written around 56, so it confirms their 70 A.D. date. The problem with hyperpreterism is that if this is the millennium for the last two years, it's the strangest millennial reign of Jesus Christ that we've ever seen. I mean, six million Jews being incinerated under the watchful eye of Jesus Christ? I don't believe so. So hyperpreterism is probably not a deal. But there are some aspects of preterism that are not so dangerous. There was a fulfillment of prophecy in 70 A.D. The temple was destroyed. Matthew 24, there are parts of it, and in Mark 13, that were fulfilled in 70 A.D. So there are parts of the preterist view of things having been fulfilled that was true. But the idea of everything being fulfilled is a false view in our understanding, in my understanding. How many of you believe that everything in the book of Revelation is symbolic? I kind of believe that everything is symbolic, but it also has a literal view as well. Yeah, I kind of believe it's, there, there's a lot of imagery in the book of Revelation that if you read the book of Revelation as a personal letter to your life, how many of you know that Armageddon, for example, the great war in the last days, how many of you know there's a war going on in you? 
Some people would interpret the Armageddon War as being something going on inside of them. It's a symbolic view, in other words. And people take the types and shadows and they apply it to their experience. Christ in you, the revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. There are ways to do that. So, there's some partial reality to the possibility that the book of Revelation is a symbolic book as well. How many of you believe that the book of Revelation is a prophecy that was set by Jesus, given to John. John gave it to the seven Dulo servants to write to the churches. How many of you believe that the prophecy is given to a generation that would literally arise, and in that generation, the prophecy would begin and quickly be finished in the last days? That's called a futurist view of the book of Revelation. There are four particular views in the book of Revelation. I, not knowing it, am a futurist. But I also embrace all the other parts because I see that there's a little bit of truth in everything. But I totally believe, 100%, that the book of Revelation is a prophecy of end time events that will be fulfilled in a generation and for 2,000 years Every generation of Christian believers around the world who have had the prophecy at their disposal have been responsible to make sure as they read the prophecy that they would look out to the world around them and see, are they the generation? Are we the generation that the prophecy is being fulfilled within? And I believe there was a wisdom of God in that because Jesus taught the early church, stay awake, be watchful. Be sober. Be alert. He never advocated anywhere for a church going to sleep except for the ten virgin parable that they all did sleep and slumber at a particular time, and it was the midnight season. So every generation of Christians should have been able to look at the prophecy of the book of Revelation and look at the world around them and say, wow, we could be that generation. There are things that are really looking like this is possible. And they should have been encouraging one another and strengthening one another and serving one another, caring for one another, loving one another, and helping one another to prepare. We are no different than any other generation that has ever existed in the last 2,000 years within the church age. We have the same message that our brothers and sisters had 2,000 years ago. And as they were seeking to understand the message, so are we seeking to understand the message. And how many of you know that there are four views, but there's probably 10,000 different interpretations of this one book? But how many of you know that I've got it right? I don't think so. I think I have a part of it. And I believe that I'm simply wanting to understand the basics so that we're clear on certain things. I am absolutely 100% positive nobody in the planet could ever come to me and say, this is not a prophecy. It is a prophecy. And I know the word prophecy means a foretelling of events to come. The only question is, were these events for 2,000 years ago, or should I be looking for them as well? The interesting thing is, when I look through the book of Revelation as a lens, and I look through the lens of prophecy of the book of Revelation, I look around the world and I see the signs of the times everywhere. I personally look through the lens of this prophecy and I see it is still existing. And I note that the letters to the seven churches are as relevant to us today as they were to the church 2,000 years ago. When we read the book of Revelation, which I want to go to chapter 2 right now, if you will, we did a little bit of this on Wednesday night, but Revelation chapter 2, for example, is a timeless message to the church of Jesus Christ. And what is that message? Let's read it together. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 2. Go ahead and read.
place to stop. Is it relative to you and I in our lives that we can potentially leave our first love? Is it possible for Christians today to lose their love? Yes. Of course it is. And so the admonition to the church 2,000 years ago is an admonition to the church today, whether it be a corporate admonition or it be a personal admonition. I can read the letters that were written to the churches and find something relative to my experience as a believer, as a child of God, as a representative, as light and salt, as a witness of Jesus Christ. I should be able to read that letter and see, where do I stand in this? Have I been doing good works and am I doing pretty good? Do I hate evil? Am I exposing that which is false and not true? Am I doing all these things and am I being approved by God for those things? But does God come to me and say, hey, you can do all those things, but you've lost your love. And remember 1 Corinthians 13, if you, if you move mountains with your faith but have not love, you're nothing. You give your body to be burned without love, you're nothing. You could prophesy now until the end of the world, but if you don't have love, it's nothing. And so the essential thing for every one of us is love. So my point is, in the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches are relative to us. So let's put another outline. And I know some of you have been here. Thanks for your patience. But I want to do this one more time. 22 chapters, a prophecy. Chapter 1, you might want to write it down. Chapter 1, if we're going to go by chapter and verse, chapter 1 is an introduction in the book of Revelation. It tells us who the letter is from. It tells us who the letter is to. It tells us who the prophecy is from, who the prophecy is to. It tells us to who it was given. It tells us all the different parts of God, and it's absolutely awesome and stunning when we study the intricacies and the details in chapter 1. But basically, when you share the book of Revelation with someone, you're sharing with them the introduction in chapter 1. Chapters 2 and 3 are the letters to the churches. That all those are, are letters to the churches to get them prepared to examine themselves to make sure that they are walking in the way that is pleasing to God so that they can be an effective witness in the region that they are in. Chapter 4 is John's visitation into heaven. Chapter 4, John is taken up, he goes into the heavenly realms and he sees the mysteries of God. He sees the four living creatures. He sees an innumerable company of angels. He sees a sea of glass like crystal before the throne. He sees seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. He sees him who sits on the throne. He sees an emerald rainbow around the throne. I mean, John is brought out of this world into another place, another dimension, in another reality, and he seeks to tell us what it is. He is telling us that there is a God in heaven whose throne is all of heaven and it is magnificent beyond measure. Why does God want to reveal this to John? Well, there's a couple of things. Number one, John needs to know who he's dealing with. <laughs> and he, he went up into a place that nobody had ever been before like this. I just don't believe that there are too many people that have gone there and have come back and have been able to tell the story. Paul the Apostle simply said, I couldn't even speak the things that I saw. Chapter 5, all of a sudden, something changes in that heavenly place. There's one with a book in his hand. And there are seven seals wrapping that book. And everybody in heaven is crying. They're weeping. They're saying, well, who is worthy to open the book? Who is going to release the seals of the book? And the elder said to John, don't cry, don't worry, don't weep. There's one who has overcome, who is worthy to open the book, and it's the Lamb of God. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. What happens? What is in that book? Come on. What's in the book? The prophecy. The prophecy is in the book. And the very first thing that happens when the first seal breaks, revelation pours forth. And where does that happen? In chapter 6. So the book of Revelation is a prophecy, and the prophecy actually begins in Revelation chapter 6. The first thing that happens with that seal broken is what? There's the release of a horse. And what was that horse? Come on, you, it's okay to talk to me. What is it? It's a white horse. 
And what is that white horse doing? He's got a bow, but no arrows. And he is conquering. Right? So he's riding and he's got a crown on his head. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 6. Let's look at it. And I'm going to throw some things at you right now that might boggle your mind. I'm going to do it very fast and then we'll leave. Uh, Revelation 6, 1, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That white horse, to me and our generation, represents the nation of Islam, because the word bow is a parchment as well. It's not a bow with arrows. There are no arrows in this rider. So there are documents, whether it's the Nobel Peace Prize or New Age Metaphysics or books out there that don't matter. But personally, I believe that it is the Quran. I believe it is the Hadith. And I believe the writer is an Islamic writer. It is also representative, possibly, of socialism. Because this parchment, this bow, is outriding right now, conquering nations, bringing Sharia law around the world. This rider is releasing in the Arab Spring, and this rider is releasing in the revolutions that are going on in the Middle East. It's riding in Spain, it's riding in Europe, it's riding in Asia. Islam is spreading around the world. Every five days in America, a new mosque begins construction in the United States. You have Muslims running homeland security. You have Muslims running different departments of government in this nation. Islam is a real deal. They are forcing their way of Sharia law into the nations. They are absolutely active within our universities and institutions. They are bringing this. They're going through, but they're saying Islam is a religion of peace. And so they're conquering through their documentation. And they are the most gro fastest growing religion in the world today is Islam. It is also representative of socialism. People love socialism because it takes care of all of their needs. And so the people literally are conquered, though, by socialism in its own paradigm. Socialism conquers a person from ever becoming who they're meant to be. Because the government takes a position of taking care of all their needs, and then the government controls the people. Remember, the borrower is slave to the lender, said the prophet Isaiah. The borrower is slave to the lender. So, my personal perspective, the white horse, socialism, Islam. Verse 3, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The only red that I know that is revolutionary is communism. We talk about the Bolshevik Revolution. It was red Russia. It is red China. That is the red countries of North Korea and other parts around the world. Communism, revolution, taking peace from the earth. That's what communism has always done. So we can look through the lens in this hour and see the white horse of socialism, the red horse of communism. And how many of you know that socialism usually leads right into communism? And how many of you know that socialism has an assemblance of peace because everybody's needs are taken care of, but communism comes behind and takes everything? How many of you know that the United States government right now has more executive orders to take everything under their control in the collapse of this society? I was shocked to read the executive orders in the United States of America. They are going to take electric. They are going to take farms. They are going to take personal property, trucks, houses, cars, waterways, seaports, airports. Read the executive orders, and the government of today is being literally transformed from a servant government to a dictatorial government that's going to take from the people and they're going to deal it out the way they want to. That is what's going on in America today through executive orders. When does an executive order become popular in any land? When an event happens and the Constitution is suspended, which, by the way, is being destroyed as we speak, there is an all-out attack against the Constitution of the United States. So executive law becomes the order of the day, the law of the land, and those executive orders are not favorable to the inhabitants of the nation. But this is not unusual. This happens all over the world. 
We're the only people that have enjoyed such prosperity for such a very long time. But we have abused what God has given to us. And we have used what God has given us for evil rather than for good. We have slaughtered 80 million innocent babies in the womb. We have shed their blood through our liberty and freedom. We have released the homosexual agenda in the nation and we have legislated it into every form of our society and yet we say it's good. God said that we've abused our power so it's obvious that other evil powers will come to rule over the nation. And so we look at this, we see the red horse bringing revolution. How did the United States of America become a nation? It was through a revolution. And the seeds of that revolution are in this land and they are certainly ready to sprout up once again. Be ready. There's a great sword given to the red horse rider. Verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. See that you hurt not the oil and the wine. What does revolution normally bring to any society? It brings famine. It brings food shortages, crises. It brings a desperate setting, an imbalance of food. A loaf of bread will cost $1,000. I mean, look at the prices of everything already. We went. I remember a few years ago going to the gas station, filling up my truck, complaining that filling up my truck was costing too much. I was given a $20 bill. Today, to fill up a car is costing $50, $60. $3 a gallon, $4 a gallon. And yet the commodity of oil has never changed. It's still the same oil it's always been. It's just amazing how the price of everything is going. But during this prophecy, God is forewarning us, you need to be prepared because people will not be able to buy the bread that they so desperately need. And if we're not preparing for that day, uh, what are people going to do? They're going to turn into thievery. They're going to turn into savagery. And people are going to be wanting to take everything they possibly can from wherever they can. And God is telling us that this is the prophecy that's going to come upon the generation to whom it is written. So I don't see this as a gloom and doom. I see God foretelling us what's going to be so we can prepare. The very next thing that, that happens here, and by the way, speaking of the white horse of Islam and the red horse of communism, do you know that it was communism and Islam in the Bolshevik revolution that murdered 50 million Bolshevik Christians? Islam and communism joined forces to murder Christians, even though they have two totally different ideologies. Communism doesn't believe in any God. Islam believes in Allah God. And yet they were able to come together because they're both motivated by Satan's hatred to murder the beautiful Christians in Russia. Fifty million people died in that revolution. My goodness. So now we come to verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. Someone say pale. Do you see how it's written? P-A-L-E. Verse 8, Randolph, P-A-L-E. I looked and behold a P-A-L-E horse. Now just put the letters in there, S-T-I-I-A-N, I, Palestinian. I look and behold a pale or Palestinian horse. And his name that sat on him was death. How many of you know that Islam is a culture of death? How many of you know that Islam is a promoter of death? The spirit of death is upon them. And the pale Palestinian horse or the pale horse rider is riding this horse. And what's happening? Hell followed with him. Why? The Bible says in Isaiah that hell is hungry and its appetite cannot be satisfied. And with the dead that are going to be gobbled up by this Palestinian horse through their nuclear terrorism and the other things they're planning to do, there's going to be a lot of dead people who are not saved that are going to go straight into hell. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. Today that would be approximately 1.5 billion people to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. You know, turn with me real quickly to uh, Revelation chapter 12 one more time. As I said, we're going to run through this quickly. Revelation chapter 12. Again, this is a prophecy of things that are going to happen. We're looking at the prophecy. So far, it's not a pretty picture. You and I need to understand our part in this. We need to know how to prepare for what's coming. God has not appointed us to His wrath. 
but he's telling us things that are going to happen in the world. Our brothers and sisters in other countries around the world have been being murdered, tortured, killed, burned. I mean, things have been happening. They're happening today. Muslims around the world are killing Christians everywhere. They are burning their villages, burning their bodies, and there is starvation happening around the world. This is all planned by the great beast that is coming into the earth. Then he says, in chapter 12, in verse 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon ah, has seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads. And I want to talk about this great red dragon for a moment because one of the things that Ezekiel the prophet was made known, uh, God made known to him was that Egypt was the great dragon. How many of you remember Ezekiel 29, verse 3 and 4? Egypt was the great dragon. Well, that was in Ezekiel's day, thousands of years ago. In the time of the fulfilling of this prophecy, who would the great red dragon be? Well, if Egypt had a pharaoh, and Egypt and pharaoh, pharaoh being the head of the Egyptian empire, they were known as the great dragon, then the great red dragon would also have someone at the head over an empire that is red. Some people believe, and it's true if you study it out, that the United Nations is a communistically controlled organization. And it doesn't matter how people start out, it's how they finish. And whatever the good intentions were at the beginning, they're certainly no longer good that the globalization, the plan for globalization by the United Nations is so real and that the agenda, when you look at it, is for a few at the top to rule the masses at the bottom, to bring solidarity, to bring community, one world religion, one world politics, one world government, one world military, one world economy, this is the agenda of the United Nations, and it's all working out until the day it will literally be fulfilled. America is a strange place. I'll tell you what I mean by that. How many of you have heard people say, America is the new Israel of God? I've heard that. Many people have said America is the new Israel of God. That God's blazing light came to this nation. And out of this nation was the glory of God revealed, and missionaries went around the world, and all these things. Well, what's interesting, I heard this on radio the other night, blew me away. There's a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 19. And in Isaiah chapter 19, it talks about Egypt, the Nile River, the capital of Egypt. How many of you know who the capital of Egypt was at that time? One of the capitals, Memphis. When I think of Egypt, I think of pyramids. And the prophecy in Isaiah 19 says that the Nile River was going to dry up. That on the east side of the Nile River, 30% of the whole land of Egypt existed. 60% on the west side of the Nile. I thought this was interesting. The United States is separated by the Mississippi River. On the Mississippi River is a city called Memphis, Tennessee. And when you cross over the bridge from Arkansas into Memphis, there's a huge pyramid. How many of you have seen it? Yeah. Humongous. It is interesting that America has 30% of its land mass on the east. Strange to me that Six somebody would actually bring a Mississippi River like a Nile, put the pyramid in the city of Memphis, and Memphis is a cotton and a um, another part of industry that they did and it's exactly the same industry of Egypt. And this prophecy says that the Nile would dry up, the waters would dry up. What's happening in the Mississippi right now? People are flying over the Mississippi. It's diminishing. It's drying up. And it says that the fishers are going to throw their hooks into the water and they're not going to be able to catch any fish because there's going to be this experience happening and things are going to turn out bad.